Hello, and thank you for joining us for this peer exchange on evolving HIV treatment landscape. The continual advancements in HIV prevention and treatment have improved survival and quality of life for patients, but have also challenged clinicians who are tasked with understanding where these new options fit into the current treatment landscape. In this peer exchange panel discussion, I am joined by infectious disease specialists who are experts in managing HIV infection. We will review HIV treatment guideline updates and discuss important considerations that will help differentiate the current therapies. Emerging agents and novel management approaches will also be discussed. My name is Dr. Joseph Iran, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Joining me for this discussion are Dr. Eric Dar. He's chief of the Division of HIV Medicine at Harvard UCLA Medical Center and also professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Colleen Kelly, associate professor of medicine for the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and Daniel Karitsky's chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Great, so uh, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here. Um, maybe Eric, you could start us off by just briefly discussing how HIV can present in the various stages and what clinicians should be looking for. Sure, so you know we live in a world now where we're supposed to be screening everybody essentially for HIV infection at least once in a lifetime and more often if they're at risk. Uh, so that should be the routine, but it, there's also, we think of three major categories, or at least I do. We think of those people who are presenting with advanced stages of disease, with opportunistic infections, weight loss, cognitive deficits. We think of people who are completely asymptomatic, which is the population that we're trying to target with our routine screening. Uh, and then we have the people in the very beginning stages, or so-called acute infection, where classically they describe with people talk about a flu or mononucleosis-like illness. Uh, but Fever is certainly the most common, but everything from sore throat, rash, oral ulcers, diarrhea, laboratory abnormalities, it's a very nonspecific syndrome, but it's one that we don't want to miss. Right. Uh, if we have somebody who we think may be at some risk, who presents with an acute febrile illness, it should be in the differential, and depending on how at risk they are, may determine how aggressive you'd be in pursuing it. But um, we have a lot of people who present with acute infection who have no symptoms, sure. some mild, many who get hospitalized because they look so ill. Uh, our current screening algorithm now includes this combination fourth generation antibody antigen test with the goal of trying to target identifying that population of people. And it, and it certainly picks up more people in the window than antibody testing alone. But I always tell the fellows and residents it's important to remember that there's still probably about 25% of people with acute infection that will be missed with the combination assay. And so the, it's a good screening test, but if you have a very high index of suspicion, you may not want to stop there. And the, the window, you mean the time between when someone actually gets infected and when they actually start having antibodies that could be detected by the older tests? Exactly, exactly. And that's where that antigen, the picking up of viral particles, part of the combination assay sort of comes into play. And I think the key, you know, is knowing that enough to ask about whether people have risk or not. I mean, because it's a common set of symptoms. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, um, Colleen, what you think about that or how you advise clinicians to, to get that kind of information. Yeah, I think it's just maintaining a high index of suspicion uh, at all times and remembering even when you're in the height of flu season, like we are right now, that HIV is still being transmitted. Uh, and just because someone has a fever and respiratory symptoms doesn't mean they also might have acute HIV infection. Sure. And so, um, you know, really probing non-judgmentally and, you know, open-ended questions, asking people about what they've been doing and what their behavior's been and what might have put them at risk for HIV. Sure. I think that's certainly key for people presenting with symptoms, but I think even in the context of general primary care, mm -hmm. physicians really need to talk to their patients about uh, what their sexual habits yes. are, as you said, in a non-judgmental, open and welcoming way, because that's how you would determine who might be at risk for more intensive or uh, frequent screening uh, outside of when they might be symptomatic. 